Uh, I welcome all to this presentation. I'm Mah Dr. Mahendra Samarvikram from Australian Red Cross. Uh, this is uh, IFRC Data and Digital Week 2021. Uh, in this presentation, I am uh, planning to uh, give an overview of uh, what are the initiatives and strategies Australian Red Cross uh, 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 perform in related to uh, da data science uh, to enhance the uh, its operations, particularly uh, uh, related to data informed decision making perspective. Uh, so let's start the presentation. Uh, in this presentation, I am uh, I try to uh, give a very high level overview, and I, because there are a lot of things to cover. In case of any uh, uh, question you have, uh, uh, please uh, email me. Then we can further discuss in detail. Thank you. So, the, so our data uh, journey start from uh, discussing the strategy. Uh, so uh, in related to the strategy, I would like to uh, explain how this uh, our data journey aligning with the Red Cross 2030 strategy. Uh, in this uh, 2030 strategy, there are seven transformations described, uh, particularly related to uh, climate change, preparedness re re for disaster, and uplifting volunteer capabilities and digital transformation. And also uh, as the la uh, last transformation that uh, focusing the in uh, financing the future and uh, fundraising business. Uh, Australian Red Cross uh, tried to build the machine learning and AI and the data as a core competency to uh, support the rest of the business. Uh, this uh, include uh, enhancing the uh, custom experience, marketing, research, uh, volunteer, and collaboration, and eventually uh, achieving the brand advocacy what uh, uh, we want. Uh, in this uh, focus, uh, we have quite, uh, quite uh, diversified data uh, that we can exploit and understand and related back uh, to relationship building with the customers uh, that we will explain uh, shortly. So if you are new to machine learning, uh, in very high level, machine learning is set of uh, algorithms uh, which can understand uh, uh, the patterns uh, in the data. So if you have uh, uh, historical data, we can run, uh, we can use these machine learning techniques to uncover, uh, understand the patterns in the data, and that pattern uh, enable us to predict the future and future behaviors. Uh, when it comes to machine learning, uh, we identified that in certain uh, aspects, uh, machine learning models uh, has certain can work as an intelligent agent. In that perspective, Australian Red Cross uh, mainly focus on data science ethics, and uh, particularly we want to uh, aligning with the fundamental principles of the Red Cross, uh, because we understand that if we uh, try to explore data science and AI, uh, that we need to be aware from the beginning uh, that what are the principles that we want to achieve through uh, this intelligence uh, building training models that we want to aligning. So there are many uh, ethical frameworks can be found, uh, but uh, this is just a uh, very popular framework, but we use multiple framework when we are assessing our ethics uh, related to when implementing uh, algorithms. Now, uh, Australian Red Cross uh, looking a full spectrum of the uh, uh, data journey, data informed decision making. This include from reporting to uh, optimizing the uh, algorithms uh, models to predict the future, uh, giving the prescriptive uh, prescriptive uh, insights uh, to the business to better uh, perform day to day jobs. Now, I would like to uh, uh, explain briefly uh, what is the uh, structure of our data science team. Uh, in very uh, like in a base of the uh, structure is that IT. IT is actually mainly 
look after data governance, data security platform as a service infrastructure perspective. Uh, data science is a, on top of IT, there is another layer that we, we can uh, explore the data within the, uh, within the business. Uh, and in this perspective, we have certain capabilities, processes, people work together to achieve high level business objectives. Uh, in, in this perspective, I would like to focus two capabilities what we recently built that one is uh, machine learning and AI capability uh, and the other one is volunteer data science team. Uh, during this uh, presentation, you will understand how we utilize these two capabilities. Uh, these two capabilities will help that is used to uh, uh, enhance our business and also uh, supporting the future focus programs like climate change, war and law, uh, like research. Now, in related to that two capabilities, the first thing is data science infrastructure. Uh, we recently built data lake uh, with uh, machine learning capability. It has also advanced visualization capability. It is a uh, data lake uh, in uh, AWS. Uh, the main component in there is SageMaker, which enable us to uh, build machine learning model quickly deploying and uh, testing on the data. At the same time, we are using advanced visualization tools uh, integrated with this uh, platform. Uh, within the platform, there are like diversified data set we can explore to enhance the business. Now, we, when we are using this data lake, we, we are focusing multiple dimensions like privacy, security, trust, and also uh, the data and insight modeling capabilities uh, to in, enhance the value of our data. Uh, that is a continuous improvement process uh, because it is, uh, uh, in fact, a complex uh, uh, data science analytics is a complex business process. Now I am. Uh, I would like to briefly explain how that those investment strategies and initiatives uh, helpful for uh, enhancing the business. Uh, very uh, like fundamentally that customer experience, personalization, fundraising is very important. In in related to uh, Red Cross Strategy 2030, also uh, financing the future is very important, and that is where this. Uh, uh, this, these initiatives are very important. Now, uh, our focus in uh, Australian Red Cross is that in Australia, there are la large number of charities, like 50,000 and more. Uh, they all actually try to reach uh, customers. Now, Red Cross uh, is another charity that we wanted to uh, uh, understand the customer uh, requirements, customer perceptions and serve them well and enhance their uh, journey with the Red Cross. In this way, in this perspective, we use data uh, and their past behaviors to understand the value proposition of the customers and diversify our uh, engagement strategy and, and fulfill their requirements. Uh, so there are two strategies like we are following Blue Ocean strategy because there are a lot of opportunities in with the emerging data, uh, we have a lot of opportunities to uh, like innovatively reach customers and uh, uh, serve their unique value propositions. Now, in terms of data science and analytics, we have what the data science and analytics serve uh, for the business is uh, we are taking the customers through a journey that by looking their past behaviors, behavioral analytics, and uh, they are their responses, we can actually uh, ta uh, engage with these donors with right campaign, right time, with uh, right content. So we believe with this strategy that we will build the relationships and brand advocacy, and eventually uh, building the fundraising business. Now, there are a lot of models we uh, implemented using machine learning and AI. Uh, particularly the personalization recommendation model, customer lifetime value model, 
uh, retention, segmentation, then sentiment analysis. We are also using proximity analysis with geocoding. Uh, we have diversified data with uh, related to our CRM, our census data, third party segmentation da data, and also the past large amount of transaction uh, that Red Cross has. Uh, this is a case study that we that if any uh, one interested that uh, we have a, uh, a context aware collaboratory filtering uh, and recency frequency value ensemble method which we use to personalize the uh, donor engagement we uh, use the past donations uh, their engagement with different uh, uh, campaigns uh, and we use the campaign attributes donor attributes and their uh, value and their preferences uh, their the donor attributes to uh, understanding what uh, donors are uh, uh, ideal and very close to certain campaigns and we uh, try to engage with relevant donors uh, engaging the relevant donors help for uh, retention their customer experience and customer advocacy now that is uh, related to how we uh, serving as a as a team to the general red cross uh, uh, in uh, fundraising business because in, in any red cross society fundraising is the main uh, main uh, business uh, requirement now the data science team need uh, quite a lot of resources uh, because uh, and and also investment uh, because of that uh, australian red cross uh, uh, aligned with the volunteer program and we introduce volunteer data science program that any uh, data scientist in industry having that right skills can join with the Australian Red Cross and to help this uh, uh, help the mobilize, mobilizing this uh, uh, and serving humanity uh, of the serving humanity. Uh, now, uh, the purpose of the uh, volunteer data science team is uh, they are diversified knowledge uh that that the and the and uh, specialized resources what they have they can serve that red cross uh, objectives at the same time as a team well, uh, data science team need to uplift the volunteer capabilities because it's one of the strategy in 20 one of the component in strategy 2030 uplifting the volunteer capabilities now i would like to uh, play a video that one of our one of the uh, our volunteer data scientist be and how she uh, feel that her service to the Red Cross through this volunteer data science program. Hello everyone, my name is B Shanyam and today I'm going to be sharing my experience as a volunteer data scientist at the Australian Red Cross. My volunteer journey started two years ago when I was working full time, but I was thinking to myself, surely I could do more and volunteering my time for humanity is something that I always want to do. It's a good way of giving something back to communities. So I started asking around at work and one of my colleagues mentioned the Australian Red Cross. I went to the website and I was trying to find a volunteering program that I could use my skills in programming and database. And I found volunteer data scientist program. In data science projects, if we look at the hierarchy of needs in data science implementation, machine learning is the very last step. So obviously, before the data can be used in machine learning, some work needs to be done. And I get to use my skills in programming and database to ensure the reliable data flows, uh, effective use of data storing, as well as data accuracy and conformity. So basically, after data gathering, I make sure that the data is ready for machine learning. In volunteer data scientist role, I get to meet new people, uh, like-minded peers, and um, also I gain a lot of real-world experience in data science projects. I was also 
fortunate to be involved in a few campaigns, including last year bushfire uh, appeal campaign. During that campaign, I felt that we were so fortunate that the Red Cross has already invested so much in innovation and technology that we were able to leverage from the latest technology like cloud platform. We were able to uh, set something up quickly to ensure that the data is available and accessible. Um, so in my experience, it's very easy to see why innovation and technology can definitely assist in improving quality of lives and help tackle humanitarian issues. Yeah, so that is our one of the volunteer data scientists uh, and her feeling uh, that involvement with the Australian Red Cross with uh, our data science and analytics team. Uh, now I would like to uh, uh, explain a little bit uh, about our some of the collaborations uh, with uni certain universities in related to innovation and transformation. Uh, Australian Red Cross has uh, part multiple partnerships and uh, in particularly uh, data science and analytics team has, is partnered with uh, University of Sydney, University of New South Wales, uh, University of Technology Sydney and Queenstown University of Technology. Uh, these partnerships actually help in uh, multiple ways yeah, and it is uh, mutually beneficial in one way in in one side uh, Australian Red Cross uh, meant that some of the students program to uh, helping uh, universities to enhance their impact their research impact to the society so in that way universities get beneficial when uh, working with the uh, australian red cross on the other hand uh, red cross uh, uh, australian red cross can uh, enhance the uh, capacity and uh, and uplift the capacity in turn in related to science and technology to achieve some of the innovative uh, products and the uh, ideas now uh, one of our a uh, well-known innovative program is mitigating risks of First Nations people related to climate change. In this project, the uh, University of Sydney and University of New South Wales and UTS collaborate with the uh, uh, Australian Red Cross. Uh, we presented, uh, we presented, uh, so there are two projects actually. Uh, I, I am uh, first explaining, uh, we have a particular program uh, to helping uh, First Nations people uh, and they are related to climate change. We know uh, that climate change is a impact has an impact to all the aspects of uh, social like social well being. However, in related to First Nations people and uh, and uh, their their perceptions because they are very close set of people peoples that very close to the environment. They get huge impact in terms of their uh, cultural heritage uh, well-being. So uh, what we did, we did a uh, innovative program uh, developing a mobile application uh, for the uh, for the First Nations peoples to uh, tell their emotions, feelings, thoughts related to climate change, and we can collect this data through a well-designed de de mobile application for future data and anal analysis. Now let's let's see how these applications work if it is well implemented that is that has a that might able to integrate with our data architecture and then we can further process the data and understanding what are the impacts and how uh, first nations people uh, uh, people feel related to climate change in strategy perspective uh, this projects uh, aligning with uh, uh, the di digital transformation helping uh, like mitigating risk related to climate change, reducing the gap of uh, health and well-being, particularly related to First Nations people. Now let's listen to this uh, video. This is actually uh, presented by in This is a work collaborated with the uh, Australian Red Cross Data Science Team and University of uh, University of New South Wales. They are trying to uh, helping uh, to uh, uh, deploy uh, First Nations people as social scientists. Uh, to uh, reduce the risks related to climate change.
Our project aims to monitor the effects of climate change on Indigenous communities regarding their health, heritage and lifestyle values in order to sustain and preserve their culture whilst also bringing awareness to climate change and the community group themselves. And um, the reason we're doing this is there is a, uh, an abundance or a lack thereof of effective monitoring solutions and what's happening is it's blurring our vision and our understanding of um, you know, how the environment is, be is impacting them. Our solution is to create a mobile application that allows individuals to make entries related to the specific climate change implications that they have observed and then also to comment on the effects they believe that this implication can have on their community, their cultural heritage and the environment around them. To promote engagement, we propose to implement a reward system. The, re the reward will be linked to local Indigenous businesses promoting cultural awareness. Working with um, these kind of important organisations really brings um, the emphasis on um, what kind of problems we can solve today and that we really make a difference. The benefit of working with a real problem, with uh, a real mentor, um, Mahendra in, in our case, um, is like you get actual feedback and it's a lot more, um, I suppose, uh, confidence building. This project has given me the opportunity to make a valuable contribution to a project that I am genuinely interested in and a project which I know has the potential to improve the lives of everyday Australians and also the world at a greater capacity. It's more personal to us than just, you know, I'm getting a preset scenario from a textbook um, like Vincent has said earlier. Um, and because it's so personal to us and because we can actually relate to it, um, it allows us to, you know, have a a more personal connection allows us to really, you know, get the creative juices flowing so we can make the best projects possible. Hello everybody, I'm Joseph, one of the developers who created the application, and I'll be taking you through an in-depth demonstration of our MVP's main functionalities alongside some user stories to give you an example of what our solution is capable of. The application was co-developed with Ethan, whilst the design was meaningfully crafted by both Alice and I. Before I begin, I'd like to point out that the backgrounds you see throughout the demo are a set of Indigenous related imagery, like art, locations, and people, which was purposely included to improve the sense of community found within the application. Additionally, the majority of dummy data displayed in the demo is being transmitted directly from an online database. That is to say, our MVP is fully functional and syncs across multiple devices. With our solution's main objective being the mobilization of citizen science to mitigate climate change risk, I'd like to begin by showcasing our survey system, the core of our application. The structure behind entries that a user makes is split into three sections. One, data on environmental observations. Two, their geographical location. And the last, opinions on the state of Indigenous health, culture and well-being. As you can see, we've aimed to keep entries short and concise so that users are able to document events they see in real time and to keep the engagement levels high, an issue which often plagues longer surveys. The split into a two-page survey gives users breathing room, whilst a single input type helps to ensure that files generated for analysis follow a consistent structure. We also took into account the data that we'd be receiving and how we can structure our surveys to provide the most meaningful information possible to the scientists who requested. By combining data from all sections, scientists are gaining an understanding of the impact of climate change on Indigenous heritage, but also local in real time environmental events that may be impacting upon these measures. To ensure integrity when dealing with citizen science, we've optimised for bad data isolation as well, meaning we've simplified the process of identifying and flagging all quality and inappropriate data that some may send. Imagine you are Clive Bell, a 30-year-old scientist employed by CSIRO to analyse data to find rainfall patterns and trends within Rugby's Lake. 
As a climate scientist, you would want to be able to monitor data on community sentiment and rainfall levels within the area. So that you the blogs or issues were caught out early before adding new entries was a fast and easy process as well, as exemplified by the consistent design of the sentiment sliders that exhibit the community's thoughts and feelings about how climate change is affecting them as well. We also wanted to make sure that creating an account was an easy process by providing constant help buttons to allow for help and documentation to progress with the process. I tested these functionalities against two different use cases as per the Agile process to ensure any bugs or issues were caught out early before the initial rollout phase. In the initial rollout of Custodian, we plan to market in collaboration with local and Indigenous businesses and organisations to widen their engagement with diverse user groups. The gamification element also will be a sole focus to ensure that users understand that being able to redeem rewards for the efforts kept them on a consistent basis to continue returning to the app. Financially, we wanted to ensure that we have proposed partnerships with government bodies and non-for-profit sectors within the same interests and being able to exemplify that impact that custodian's purpose is making. We also wanted to ensure that leaderboard was kept as a long-term feature to ensure that users continue to build a community and friendly competition amongst them as well. And being able to exemplify the messaging function also ensures to exemplify how big an impact custodian users are making on Australia's climate change. Custodia faces risk within its initial rollout and future implementation. To minimize every time a user wants to enter data, this ensures them with the knowledge that they are consenting to sharing their data and having their data stored within the database to be used by the scientific community. The second consideration was the abuse of the system's rewards, and this was to enable a future implementation of a set limit of how many times or how many points a user can accrue according to their location or postcode. The third thing was also the data quality control, and by having structured data fields, it makes it easier for scientists to filter through good and bad data and harder for users to enter bad quality data. Okay, that is uh, about uh, that one of our collaboration with UNSW. Uh, related to developing a mobile app to bring uh, uh, first nations people as uh, first nation people as social scientists to uh, uh, mitigating risk their risks now we did uh, an, we are in uh, partnered with the uh, university of sydney related to another climate change research that research actually basically try to understand uh, the climate change impact uh, related by measuring the uh, changes in natural soundscape. We select these natural, uh, natural soundscapes as a uh, KPI that, that, that the measure, that the measure uh, because uh, it is one of the uh, very closely related uh, measure which can be related back to uh, First Nations people because we know Earth's natural soundscapes is very much close to uh, environmental friendly people. Uh, we presented this uh, in the last uh, Climate Red Summit. Uh, the title was Mitigating Risk Related to Changing Earth's Natural Soundscapes Due to Climate Change. Uh, uh, the climate change is an important research focus to mitigating future risks and vulnerabilities to uh, society. In particular, we are exploring acoustic measurements of the ecological soundscape in regions of Australian sensitive to climate change. The ecological soundscape can provide information related to social, social, cultural, and ecological aspects of the climate change. So let's listen to uh, the Professor Craig Jean, one of our volunteer data scientists. All of the people today talk uh, are volunteer part of the volunteer data scientist team. They are related. They are linked. They are on the in one hand. They are uh, like university lecturers, professors, uh, academics. And on the other hand, we bring them into uh, Australians or uh, Australian Red Cross as a volunteer data scientist. Let's listen to uh, Professor Craig Jean. Hi, everyone. My name is Craig Jean, and it's a great opportunity to volunteer with the Red Cross and link some university research efforts with the efforts of the Red Cross serving humanity. I am director of the Computing and Audio Research Laboratory here at the University of Sydney, and our lab has over two decades of experience in acoustic science and engineering. As an example of our work, we have contributed a spatial hearing aid algorithm for the Starkey hearing aid branded as acuity immersion in a commercial context. 
climate change is an important research focus to mitigate future risk and vulnerabilities to societies. Along these lines, we can work together with the Red Cross to provide benefit. In particular, we are exploring acoustic measurements of the ecological soundscape in regions of Australia sensitive to climate change. The ecological soundscape can provide information related to the social, cultural, and ecological aspects of climate change. In this perspective, we are focusing on the fact that climate change poses a major threat to the health of indigenous communities and their ability to sustain their traditional life, language, and cultural heritage. Therefore, we intend to monitor the effects of climate change via its impact on ecological soundscapes around indigenous communities. As a proof of concept, we are planning to measure the acoustics of natural habitats around indigenous communities and also measure the acoustics within the indigenous community. In this way, we can explore the interrelationship between the ecological aspects and the social and cultural aspects of climate change. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My Yeah, well, so I'm an associate professor at the um, University of Sydney, and I work in um, acoustics and audio. So I head the computing and audio research lab. So, and I'm also a volunteer for Red Cross now through Mahendra, and we've been speaking about soundscape ecology and climate change. And so we've been having a look at that. And so I've just put together um, a little um, set of slides here. So basically, um, it's a relatively new field, really, it's been around since the 1960s, but really modernized in 2011, so it's called soundscape ecology. And it's just like landscape ecology, where you're looking at, um, you know, animals and species and interaction with the landscape. And now we're, now we're including um, sound in, into that. And so it's just having um, a look at these things. So there's the landscape, there's climate that impacts onto this, and you have a number of things. There's natural um, events, natural um, populations, and natural um, geophysical things. You have soundscape patterns and you have human activities that, of course, impact in both. More than Australia, offshore, climate change is going to affect everything there. It looks like carbon dioxide levels can affect plants. It's going to affect the human and natural systems, low-lying settlements, estuarine ecosystems, coral reefs, which Marine food chains and so forth, and so in in that area, if you if you look at what people are saying, there's particular areas that are going to be particular populations that are particularly vulnerable. Um, so there's something new here. What is that saying? Port Headland. I have to. I, I have never been to the Northern Territory myself, so um, I, I I don't know the areas. But so this study is indicating, for example, around area around Broome here, the Salts Creek. So there there are areas that are particularly uh, that, that have people are particularly vulnerable to the change that's going to happen. And so we've been speaking about trying to do a soundscape um, recordings. And so, I mean, it, it's really it's got to span a long period of time and it's got to have other data as well. But it's, it's a great time to do something like this. The technology is sort of there. And in addition, there's a lot of good reasons to do this. So we're looking to record ecological soundscapes for research purposes. As I already said, there's a lot of research areas in ecological soundscape or soundscape ecology, but we're targeting climate change in Aboriginal culture. And so we do want to have get access to accurate climate data. So that's going to associate with our soundscape recordings. We definitely want to record anthropony. Um, so we, 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 want to, we want to get sounds related to Aboriginal culture. We have to identify what are the impacts and issues around that area? We know that they don't like photos taken, but sounds may be a bit different, but this is really um, to preserve their culture, the soundscape culture and what it's like to live there. It's just normal daily people sounds in their gatherings, different different things like that. And, and that sort of thing would be easy to analyze in a soundscape recording as well. And, and then what we can do is we can look, we would be looking to place recordings in culturally significant surroundings near where people would congregate and stuff like that. So we would have also sounds of from the landscapes of the biophony and geophony, which we can then try and correlate with the measurements that we would get from the anthropony that, that we would measure. So if there are changes, and again, we, we have to be looking for long time scales here. So we're looking to do research. We're, we're talking on the order of decades um, 
here when we're trying to get this type of data. And we can correlate those and then obviously relate that to climate change as, as we have, as we can measure the impacts of climate change and we see changes. And this is going to give, then provide society a way to hear. I, I do want to get some photos as well of the changes in the regions that we're recording, but it's just going to give society a way to hear the impacts of climate change, which, you know, it's, it's always good to make things closer so that people get more, um, you know, you know, closer to what the impacts, what's happening. And if you can hear something and see something, then obviously it's going to make more impact up, upon you. So this is what we've been talking about so far. And so we are hoping to get this together. I'm, I'm currently looking to purchase several of these devices here so these were made at the university of oxford they're easy to get they've got weather housing as well it can go to ultrasonic frequencies though i don't know if we require that or not we would require that if there are bats in the relevant area then we might want to go to the ultrasonic frequencies if not then we wouldn't need to do that um Mahendra and i've been talking about you know setting some up in our backyard just to calibrate them do various things but our concern is we need to put these in, in remote areas and we need to we need to target the correct areas and we would need people to help us with you know switching the audio card switching the batteries and stuff like that so while the technology is there and it's easy it, it still requires some maintenance um, and so forth so that's sort of where the project is sitting now this is what we've been talking about and so I'm quite keen on doing this as a research project but also then to involve um the red cross in any way that would be appropriate um from from their point of view so i might leave it there and try and get some feedback okay uh, that is uh, relate in related to uh, measuring natural uh, Acoustic uh, natural soundscapes and understanding the impacts related to cl climate change, and uh, that might have opportunity for looking look back to the First Nations peoples uh, because soundscape ecology and uh, First Nation people has some relationship. I would like to now discuss a little bit about future opportunities. Uh, some of the partnerships we are still building to do certain uh, innovative projects. Now, one project is uh, the Do Good Robotics. We are partnered with Australia as one of the leading uh, uh, robotics and automation uh, lab in University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, this is Dr. Ravi uh, Ranasinghe. He's a volunteer data scientist in Red Cross as well. Uh, he, is, uh, he is working with the data science team to think is there any opportunity in the robotics and automation domain that uh, to serving humanity? Let's listen to him. Hi, everyone. I'm Ravin Rana a senior researcher at the uh, University of Technology, Sydney, and also work as a volunteer data scientist uh, at Australian Red Cross. In this collaboration, work with Red Cross, uh, my main objective is to serve humanity by bringing our research outcomes to the social benefits. We are one of the largest uh, robotics research groups in Australia with years of experience in machine learning, perception, sensing, signal processing and sensor networks. We believe that our expertise in these core research areas are very valuable in the pursuit of finding solutions to the impact of uh, climate change, especially to the Australian indigenous community. We believe there exists a very strong synergy between Australian Red Cross motivations and research values of our university on serving communities in related to the climate change issues. We plan to contribute to gather useful information using various sensors that could be used to identify direct or proxy cues for environmental changes. This is a great opportunity to work with Australian Red Cross and to eventually serve humanity. Thank you. 
Hi everyone. Uh, similar, similar to that climate change, what he talked about, there are opportunities uh, uh, that uh, making policies in because we all know robotics uh, and drone technology, robotics, AI, uh, humanoid robotics are now emerging. They are uh, they are you deployed in uh, different different uh, applications and still uh, red cross has a role looking into uh, uh, certain aspects of these uh, deployments uh, and think uh, both in uh, humanitarian and international humanitarian law there are different aspects that red cross do can look into this robotics uh, field uh, and australian red cross is uh, uh, engage with and collaborate with the uh, relevant uh, special uh, re relevant people who can support this we still don't know what are the possible opportunities uh, one we can see re uh, like earlier autonomous weapon systems and policy making because th that need uh, certain skills in uh, related to ai robotics and human robotics discipline knowledge uh, we are not uh, uh, engaged with uh, any projects, but this is a possible opportunity. At the same time, uh, there are opportunities in uh, uh, involving uh, mo uh, advanced mobility devices in related to uh, serving humanity. Uh, still, I'm not quite sure how it's aligning with the retro strategy, but uh, there are opportunities with that lab. Uh, related to uh, these uh, robotic field and bring those uh, innovative products to serving humanity. Uh, we are we have also uh, certain disaster and emer uh, emergency research. Uh, still, it is a future opportunity. We are still not actively work on certain project. I recently had opportunity to uh, participate in. Uh, a certain research in University of Sydney, which is uh, uh, which is related to uh, head uh, mo acoustic morphology, uh, mo morpho acoustics uh, analysis of ear. Uh, that research uh, can bring uh, certain products, can design certain products, can uh, enhance the awareness in certain uh, emergency situations like firefighting, search and rescue. So this is a very cutting edge uh, technology uh, uh, that it's still a research, but uh, has uh, has possible ha has uh, significant potential to uh, design and uh, uh, innovate a product which can serve uh, humanity in more more important ways, uh, particularly related to certain disaster preparedness. Uh, now those are some dis. Uh, at, at the moment, uh, 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 until now, I talk a lot of uh, projects related to pre disaster preparedness, climate change. Uh, at the same time, we are working on certain projects uh, for building trust in fundraising because we know financing the future is very important. And, and the, in this perspective, uh, uh, enhancing the fundraising business is, uh, is key uh, component. Uh, we recently engaged uh, with certain universities to uh, think what are the how to optimize the data informed decision making process. Uh, this is we are we are using this. We have a lot of capabilities, but still certain research is important to validate and, and check whether we are optimized in this domain. Uh, following our two projects, uh, let's listen to them. Hi there, my name is Idris Asurbi. I am a PhD student at the School of Computer Science, University of Technology, Sydney. I am supervised by Dr. Mukesh Prasad and Dr. Reno Garwal. Our research project is to build an artifact to analyze donors' behaviors in nonprofit organizations. So, why we are conducting this research project? When we conducted our uh, literature review on uh, the application of data analytics in uh, in nonprofit organizations, we found that uh, nonprofit organizations, or most of them, they have some challenges, such as lack of resources, human technical and expertise. Also, there is a high expenses to develop data analytics systems to analyze donors' behaviors, uh, and also 
privacy and unintended discriminations as reported in the literature. For this reason, 90% of nonprofit organizations, they collect data, but this data is unutilized. This led us to be motivated to design a decision support system to analyze donors' behaviors. Donors' behaviors could be donors' intention, donors' frequency, and the same thing will be applied for donor, for uh, volunteers as well. Um, the data helps us to resolve certain problems by describing and predicting uh, those behaviors. And also using the machine learning techniques also we, that can be helped that can be helpful for nonprofit organizations. In our research project, uh, our research methodology uh, follows PFAS data science framework. We have six stages. Most importantly, uh, we have an evaluation stage. During this evaluation, we will be collaborating with uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, especially uh, data science and decision support experts, to evaluate our framework, our data requirements, our data, our design requirements, our design principles, and our design features, and also to validate the models later on. Our aim with nonprofit organizations through this collaboration, we aim to validate our framework uh, in the involved stages, especially the evaluation. The evaluation will include several interviews and uh, during our three iterations in the previous framework. At this stage, the, um, we have initial uh, collaboration with data science analytics team at uh, Australian Red Cross. Um, this will help us by this collaboration uh, to robust our research project and validating our models with data science, um, decision support system experts in nonprofit organizations. Also, this collaboration will help humanity by uplifting data informed decision making capabilities for charities. Thank you. Hi there. So that that is a project we can uh, initiated with uh, UTS to drive our leadership to enhance this data driven decision making process uh, that can be benefit to many other charities and uh, potential opportunity for Red Cross to lead this uh, uh, industry. So this is another project to uh, enhancing the uh, enhancing how organization can uh, improve uh, their uh, their strategies in related to decision making. Hi, I'm Rochelle Nivasinghe, a PhD candidate at School of Accountancy, Faculty of Business and Law, Queensland University of Technology, or KUT, and I'm currently in my second year of study. Uh, my PhD research project focuses on understanding how big data influences management and control capabilities in organizations. Uh, my supervisors for this research project are Dr. Ogun Nijibashi Abdu and Dr. Natalie Elms of the School of Accountancy. Uh, this research project has been approved by the Higher Degrees Research Committee of KUT and the KUT Ethics Committee as a low risk research study. Uh, there are several reasons that motivated me to initiate this research project. As you know, big data is a popular topic of discussion in many fields. However, very little is known about how it actually adds value to organizations that choose to invest in it. While there are reports on success stories, organizations are the risk of failing uh, to achieve expected outcomes unless big data operations are planned, executed, and governed with care. Without empirical or practical insights, it's hard to improve our knowledge and take uh, the discussion of big data value further. And coming from a management accounting background, I want to explore how organizations use big data as a resource that supports uh, management and control abilities, thereby adding value to the overall organizational performance. While I was exploring suitable case organizations, I identified that the Australian Red Cross had initiated big data and data analytics operations over time. Uh, we recognize uh, the Australian Red Cross as an organization which has provided the community a tremendous service over the years. Uh, apart from the ongoing humanitarian efforts, I understand that recent years 
have brought new and unprecedented challenges to its operations. Then in Australia as a full-time student since mid-2019, uh, I experienced the 2019-20 bushfires that caused um, catastrophic uh, results to several regions and then the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, which has disrupted our lives to this day. So despite the distance that the pandemic, the pandemic has created between people, uh, this is a moment that the service of nonprofit charities is most needed and a time where strategies of uh, reaching out to those in need uh, must be rethought. Focused on global reach through local action, including inspiring goals, significant global cha challenges, and several changes, including digital transformation, than for 2030, I believe that the Australian Red Cross will be able to shed some light on how their big data initiatives are supporting these efforts. Uh, my research will explore the experience of the Australian Red Cross um, has had to be big data so far. Uh, why is big data worthwhile to an organization such as the Australian Red Cross? And how has big data helped with the management and control capabilities um, amid uh, such unprecedented challenges? And in general, what can we learn from this experience are some questions that I attempt to answer. By doing so, my study will provide an objective evaluation of the big data initiatives of the Australian Red Cross in terms of how it is impacting management control capabilities and ultimately the services that have been offered. I'm thankful to the Australian Red Cross data science and analytics team for this collaboration and for giving me an opportunity to understand the value of big data from a humanitarian perspective. Uh, within my uh, research study, it will uh, provide a unique perspective different than that of a general corporate organization. So this collaboration would add fresh perspectives uh, on what big data means to nonprofit uh, and charities. The insights that I gain through this partnership will indeed be helpful in several ways. For example, it could enhance the academic and practitioner understanding of big data, be useful to further research uh, for future researchers uh, focused on management controls and will also support humanitarian initiatives by enabling charities that are yet to adopt uh, data strategies to understand and draw inspiration uh, from the big data experience of the Australian Red Cross. Once again, I thank the data science and analytics team of the Australian Red Cross for this opportunity and I'm looking forward to this learning experience. Thank you very much. Yep, so that will uh, conclude our uh, presentation. So I will summarize. So Australian Red Cross data science and analytics team is working to build this machine learning, AI and data capabilities as core competency to enhance the business. This include enhancing the customer experience, research, innovation, partnership, brand advocacy, future focus program, a volunteer program, strategy, collaboration, and all the aspects. So this is what we discussed right now and how a data science team uh, working to enhance the data-driven value creation. Thank you very much. So if you want any uh, further detail, please contact me. I'm Dr. Mahendra Samarvikrama, Manager of Data Science and Analytics, Australian Red Cross. Thank you very much. You can ask any question if you have, but we have very short time, but please contact us via email. I do have a question, if, uh, if I may. Yeah, please, please ask. Thanks, uh, I put it in the chat as well. So my name is Luke Cayley. I'm the information management lead at the IFRC in Geneva. Um, question is about one of the, um, I mean, thanks for the presentations for uh, all these different interesting and valuable uh, initiatives are uh, excellent uh, to see the, the, the work that's that's coming and is already ongoing. Um, I was particularly interested because of the role that I play um, in the uh, project around uh, understanding donor behavior and how a data informed um, uh, decision making process could be optimized. Um, particularly, well, two things. First, the, the statistic that 90% um, of um, NGOs don't 
make use of the data that they're um, uh, collecting. I would love to see the, the, the citation, the reference for that, um, because it's quite striking. Um, uh, and the second one, just to uh, understand a little bit more uh, from the, uh, the project leads, um, what you mean in this context by donors um, and uh, some of the metrics that you're, um, you, you're using to, to track their behavior. Um, hope that's clear. Over. Yeah, so, uh, so our uh, focus is to building a very comprehensive uh, personalization engine. Uh, so that include uh, some classification models and clustering segmentation models based on machine learning. Uh, we, uh, are, we have operationalized model, uh, uh, like in technical terms, context aware collaborative filtering, which enable us to uh, understand uh, how certain donors are uh, uh, relates to certain campaigns, how different uh, donors are relates to each other. Uh, so, so the primary focus is uh, utilizing uh, the data that what we already have, we have a, a huge transactions uh, in our database. Uh, and also we are using third party uh, segmentations like uh, we are partnered with uh, geo tribes uh, you know, organization in australia to understand certain segmentations we have australian census data so eventually what will happen we are building machine learning models to uh, predict the certain donors uh, preferences to certain campaigns and uh, and their predicted donation amounts their value all can be uncovered based on the large big data we have so with this, with that, uh, with that insight, uh, in related to what your question is, data informed decision making, what we can do is we can try to engage the right donor with right content, right time, with right strategy, which will enhance their uh, custom experience. So machine learning is the core capability which bring that uh, insight because machine learning algorithms like. Uh, uh, classification models, uh, clustering, they enable certain identify the patterns. Did I answer that your question or what, anything missing? Hello? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, you did answer my question. I think you're talking about individual donors rather than donor entities, organizations. Um, so that's interesting to know. Um, the, the second question I was asking is around the citation for uh, the ninety percent of NGOs don't use um, uh, the, the data that's available for them. Um, I mean, first, firstly, the yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, so there are a lot of uh, data silos in most because uh, data the in, the initial investment on the data is very uh, expensive for not pro, not for profit organizations. There are quite large amount of data silos. Building uh, this kind of data lake uh, requires certain efforts, time, uh, resources. So uh, I'm not quite sure that uh, whether all charities has this, this kind of uh, capacity capability to build such a infrastructure uh, for data governance perspective, because eventually what it matters is the data. So so the uh, even though that some capabilities in machine learning can be bring into uh, the ecosystem uh, the most complex part is how to uh, enrich the data and bring these data silos into one platform so that is the main reason that 90% uh, of data cannot be used that makes sense and um, it's great to learn a little bit more about how you've um achieve that level level of data governance um uh, i'll be in touch and thanks a lot for the presentations today yeah. thank you very much so if there are no questions uh, we can finish this meeting uh, i i will share this uh, presentation if possible if there is an email or anything for the participants uh, so please keep in touch uh, and we are happy to uh, share what the, all the knowledge what we have to enhance the other Red Cross societies. Thank you very much.